all of the stuff about doing it to everything in the mini batch for you, right? So let's pretend there's just one user, right? So grab that user and what is this? Self dot u underscore weight. Self dot u underscore weight is an embedding. We create an embedding for each of users by factors, items by factors, users by one, items by one. Now that makes sense, right? So users by one is here. That's the users bias, right? And then users by factor is here. So users by factors is the first tuple, so that's going to go in u underscore weight. And users comma one is the third, so that's going to go in u underscore bias. So remember, when PyTorch creates our nn.module, it calls dunder init. And so this is where we have to create our weight matrices, right? And we don't normally create the actual weight matrix tensors. We normally use PyTorch's convenience functions to do that for us. And we're going to see some of that after the break. So for now, just recognize that this function is going to create an embedding matrix for us. It's going to be a PyTorch nn dot module as well. So therefore, to actually pass stuff into that embedding matrix and get activations out, you treat it as if it was a function. Okay? Stick it in parentheses. So if you want to look in the PyTorch source code and find nn.embedding, you will find there's something called dot .forward in there, which will do this array lookup for us. So here's where we grab the users. Um, here's where we grab the items. And so we've now got the embeddings for each, right? And so at this point, we're kind of like here, and we found that and that. So we multiply them together and sum them up. And then we add on the user bias and the item bias. And then if we've got a Y range, then we do our sigmoid trick. And so the nice thing is, you, know, you now understand the entirety of this model. And this is not just any model. This is a model that we just found is, at the very least, highly competitive with and perhaps slightly better than some published table of pretty good numbers from a software group that does nothing but this. So you're doing well, right? This is nice. Um, so that's um, probably a good place to have a break. And so after the break, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the one piece of this puzzle we haven't learnt yet, which is what the hell does this do? Okay, uh, so let's come back at um, 7.50. Okay, um, so uh, this idea of interpreting embeddings is really interesting. And uh, as we'll see later in this lesson, um, the, the things that we uh, create for categorical variables more generally in tabular data sets are also embedding matrices. Um, and again, that's just a normal matrix multiply by a one-hot encoded uh, input where we skip the computational, computational and memory burden of it by doing it in a more efficient way. And it happens to end up with these interesting semantics kind of accidentally. Um, and uh, there was this really interesting paper uh, by these folks um, who came second in a Kaggle competition for something called uh, Rossman. Um, we'll probably look in more detail at the Rossman competition in part two. Uh, I think we're going to run out of time in part one. Um, but it, it's basically this pretty standard uh, tabular stuff, the main interesting stuff is in the pre-processing. Um, um, and it was interesting because they, they came second despite the fact that the, the person who came first and pretty much everybody else towards the top of the leaderboard did a massive amount of highly specific feature engineering, uh, whereas these folks did way less feature engineering than anybody else. Um, but instead they used a neural net, and this was at a time in 2016 when just no one did that. No one was doing neural nets for tabular data. Um, so they have, you know, the, the kind of stuff that we've been talking about um, 
kind of arose there, or at least was kind of popularized there. And when I say popularized, I mean only popularized a tiny bit. Still, most people aren't aware of this idea. Um, but it's pretty cool, because in their paper, they showed that the mean average percentage error for various techniques, k nearest neighbors, random forest, and gradient booster trees, um, uh, well, first, you know, neural nets just worked, worked, worked a lot better, but then with entity embeddings, which is what they call this, just using entity matrices in tabular data, um, you could actually, they actually added the entity embeddings to all of these different tasks after training them, and they all got way better, right? So neural nets with entity embeddings are still the best, but a random forest with entity embeddings was not at all far behind, and you know that's often kind of that's kind of nice, right? Because you could train these entity matrices for products or stores or genome motifs or whatever, and then use them in lots of different models. Possibly, you know, using faster things like random forests, um, uh, but getting a lot of the benefits. But here was something interesting: they took um, a two-dimensional projection. Of their um, of their embedding matrix for um, state, for example, German state, because this was a German supermarket chain, I think, um, using the same kind of approach we did. I don't remember if they used PCA or something else slightly like different. Um, and then here's the interesting thing: um, I've I've circled here, you know, a, a few things in this embedding space, and I've circled it with the same color over here, and here I've circled some. Same color over here, and it's like, oh my god, the embedding projection has actually discovered geography. Like they, they didn't do that, right? But it's 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 found things that are nearby each other in grocery purchasing patterns, because this was about predicting how many sales there will be. You know, it it, it there is some geographic element of that. In fact, here is a graph of the distance between two embedding vectors. So you can just take an embedding vector and say, what's the sum of squared, you know, compared to some other embedding vector, and that's the Euclidean distance. What's the distance in embedding space? And then plot it against the distance in real life between shops, and you get this very strong positive correlation. Uh, here is an embedding space for the days of the week, and as you can see, there's a very clear path through them. Here's the embedding space for the month of the year. And again, there's a very clear path through them. So like, embeddings are amazing. And um, I don't feel like anybody's even close to exploring the kind of interpretation that you could get, right? So if you've got genome motifs or plant species or products that your shop sells or whatever, like it would be really interesting to train a few models and try and kind of fine tune some embeddings and then like start looking at them in these ways in terms of similarity to other ones and clustering them and projecting them into 2D spaces and whatever. I think it's really interesting. Uh, so we were trying to make sure we understood what every line of code did in this um, pretty good uh, collab learner model we built. And so the one piece missing is this WD piece. And WD starts, stands for weight decay. So what is weight decay? Weight decay is a type of regularization. What is regularization? Well, let's start by going back to this nice little chart that um, Andrew Ng did in his um, terrific machine learning course, where he plot, you know, plotted some data and then showed a few different lines through it. This one here, um, because Andrew's at Stanford, he has to use Greek letters. Okay, so we can say this is A plus BX, but you know, if you want to go there, theta naught plus theta one X um, is a line, right? It's a line, even if it's got Greek letters, it's still a line. Um, so here's a second degree polynomial, A plus BX plus CX squared, bit of curve, right? And here's a high degree polynomial, which is curvy as anything. So models with more parameters tend to look more like this. And so in traditional statistics, we say, hey, let's use less parameters. 
because we don't want it to look like this. Because if it looks like this, then the predictions over here and over here, they're going to be all wrong. Right? It's not going to generalize well. We're overfitting. So we avoid overfitting by using less parameters. And so if any of you are unlucky enough to have been brainwashed by a background in statistics or psychology or econometrics or any of these kinds of courses, you'll have, you know, you're going to have to unlearn the idea that you need less parameters. Because what you instead need to realize this is you were fed this lie that you need less parameters because it's a convenient fiction for the real truth, which is you don't want your function to be too complex. And having less parameters is one way of making it less complex. But what if you had a thousand parameters and 999 of those parameters were 1e neg 9? Well, what if there was zero? If there's zero, they're not, they're not really there. Or if they're 1e neg 9, they're hardly there, right? So like, why can't I have lots of parameters if like lots of them are really small? And the answer is, you can, okay? You know, so this, this thing of like counting the number of parameters is how we limit complexity is actually extremely limiting. It's a fiction that really has a lot of problems, right? And so if in your head complexity is scored by how many parameters you have, you're doing it all wrong, right? Score it properly, right? So why do we care? Why would I want to use more parameters? Because more parameters means more nonlinearities, more interactions, more curvy bits, right? And real life is full of curvy bits, right? Real life does not look like this. But we don't want them to be more curvy than necessary or more interacting than necessary. So therefore, let's use lots of parameters and then penalize complexity. Okay, so one way to penalize complexity is, as I kind of suggested before, is let's sum up the value of your parameters. Now that doesn't quite work because some parameters are positive and some are negative, right? So what if we sum up the square of the parameters, right? And that's actually a really good idea. Right? Let's actually create a model, and in the loss function, we're going to add the sum of the square of the parameters. Now, here's the problem with that, though. Maybe that number is way too big, and it's so big that the best loss is to set all of the parameters to zero. Now, that would be no good. Right? So actually, we want to make sure that doesn't happen. So therefore, let's not just add the sum of the squares of the parameters to the model, but let's multiply that by some number that we choose. And that number that we choose in FastAI is called WD. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take our loss function, and we're going to add to it the sum of the squares of the parameters multiplied by some number. WD. What should that number be? Well, generally, it should be 0 0.1. Okay. People with fancy machine learning PhDs are extremely skeptical and dismissive of, of any claims that a learning rate can be 3e e neg 3 most of the time or a weight decay can be 0.1 most of the time. But here's the thing. We've done a lot of experiments on a lot of data sets, and we've had a lot of trouble finding anywhere a weight decay of 0.1 isn't great. However, we don't make that the default. We actually make the default 0.01. Why? Because in those rare occasions where you have too much weight decay, no matter how much you train, it just never quite fits well enough. Where else, if you have too little weight decay, you can still train well. You'll just start to overfit, so you just have to stop a little bit early. So we've been a little bit conservative with our defaults, but my suggestion to you is this. Now that you know that every learner has a WD argument, and I should mention, you won't always see it in this list, 
right? Because there's this concept of KW args in Python, which is basically parameters that are going to get passed up the chain to the next thing that we call. And so basically all of the learners will call eventually this constructor, and this constructor has a WD, right? So this is just one of those things that you can either look in the docs or you, you now know it. Anytime you're constructing a learner from pretty much any kind of function in FastAI, you can pass WD, okay? And so passing um, point 0.1 instead of the default point 0.01 will often help. Okay, so give it a go. Um, so what's really going on here? It would be helpful, I think, to go back to lesson two SGD. Because everything we're doing for the rest of today really is based on this, right? And this is where we created some um, data, um, and, then we try, and then we added a loss function, MSC, and then we created a function called update, which calculated our predictions. That's our weight, make, uh, matrix multiply. Uh, this is just a one layer, so there's no um, ReLU. Um, we calculated our loss using that mean squared error. We calculated the gradients using loss.backward. We then subtracted in place the learning rate times the gradients, and that is gradient descent. So if you haven't reviewed lesson two SGD, please do, because this is where we're, this is our starting point. So if you don't get this, then none of this is going to make sense. If you're watching the video, maybe pause now, go back, rewatch this part of lesson two, make sure you get it. Um, remember, a dot sub underscore is basically the same as a minus equals because a dot sub is subtract and everything in PyTorch, if you add an underscore to it, means do it in place. So this is updating our a parameters, which started out as minus 0.11. We just arbitrarily picked those numbers and it gradually makes them better. Right? So Let's write that down. So um, we are trying to calculate the um, parameters. I'm going to call them weights because this is just more common. Um, in kind of epoch t or time t. And they're going to be equal to whatever the weights were in the previous epoch minus our learning rate multiplied by, it's the derivative of our loss function with respect to our weights at time t minus one. Okay, so um, that's, that's what this is doing. Okay, and we don't have to calculate the derivative because it's boring and because it, computers do it for us fast um, and then they store it here for us, so we're good to go, okay? So make sure you're exceptionally comfortable with either that equation or that line of code because they're the same thing. Um, where do we go from here? All right. So, what's that? What's our loss? Our loss is some function of our independent variable, variables, x, and our weights, right? And in our case, we're using mean squared error, for example, and it's between our predictions and our actuals, right? So where does X and W come in? Well, our predictions come from running some model, we'll call it M, on those predictions and that model contains some weights, right? So that's, that's what our loss function might be. And this might be all kinds of other loss functions, we'll see some more today. And so that's what ends up creating a.grad, 
over here. So we're going to do something else. We're going to add weight decay, some number, which in our case is 0 0.1, times times the sum of weights squared. OK? So let's do that. And let's make it interesting by not using synthetic data, but let's use some real data. And uh, we're going to use MNIST, the hand-drawn digits. Right? But we're going to do this as a standard, fully connected net, not as a convolutional net, because we haven't learnt the details of how to really create one of those from scratch. So in this case, there's actually uh, deeplearning.net provides MNIST as a, uh, a Python pickle file. In other words, it's a file that, pickle, that Python can just open up and it'll give you NumPy arrays straight away, and they're flat NumPy arrays. We don't have to do anything to them. Uh, so go grab that. Um, and it's a gzipped file, so you can actually just gzip.open it directly. Um, and then you can pickle.load it directly. And again, encoding equals Latin 1 because, yeah, you know. And then we can just put that, that'll give us the training, the validation, and the test set. I don't care about the test set. So generally in Python, if there's like something you don't care about, you tend to use this special variable called underscore. There's no reason you have to. It's just kind of people know you mean I don't care about this, right? So there's our training, uh, training x and y and our valid x and y. Um, now this actually comes in as a, as you can see, if I print the shape, 50,000 rows by 784 columns. But those 784 columns are actually 28 by 28 pixel pictures. So if I reshape one of them into a 28 by 28 pixel picture and plot it, right, then you can see it's the number five. Okay, so that's our data. We've seen MNIST before in its uh, kind of pre-reshaped version. Here it is in its flattened version. So I'm going to be using it in its flattened version, okay? Um, and uh, currently they are um, NumPy arrays. I need them to be tensors, so I can just map torch.tensor across all of them, and so now they're tensors. Okay. Um, I may as well create a variable with the number of things I have, which we normally call n, and remember we normally have a thing called, you know, we tend to use c to mean the number of activations we need. Um, uh, well, actually, sorry, this is not going to be activations. Sorry, this is going to be number of columns. Um, that's not a great name for it, sorry. Um, okay, so there we are. And then um, the, uh, the y, not surprisingly, the minimum value is zero and the maximum value is nine because that's the actual number we're trying to predict. Great. Um, so in lesson two SGD, we, like, we created uh, a data where we actually added a column of ones on so that we didn't have to worry about bias. We're not going to do that. We're going to have PyTorch do that kind of implicitly for us. We had to write our own MSC function. We're not going to do that. We had to write our own little matrix multiplication thing. We're not going to do that. We're going to have PyTorch do all this stuff for us now. Okay. And um, what's more and really important, we're going to, we're going to do mini batches, right? Because this is a big enough data set. We probably don't want to do it all at once. Um, so if you want to do mini batches, um, so we're, good, we're good, not going to use too much fast AI stuff here. Um, uh, PyTorch has something called Tensor Dataset that um, basically grabs a um, uh, any kind of tensor, uh, or, sorry, two tensors, and creates a data set. Remember, a data set is something where if you index into it, you get back uh, an X value and a Y value, just one of them, OK? Um, so it kind of looks like it looks a lot like a list of x, y tuples. Um, once you have a data set, uh, then you can use a little bit of convenience uh, by calling databunch.create. And what's that going to do is it's going to create um, data loaders for you. A data loader is something which um, you don't say, I want the first thing or the fifth thing. You just say, I want the next thing. And it will give you a batch, a mini batch of whatever size you asked for. And specifically, it'll give you the X and the Y of a mini batch. So if I just grab the next of the iterator, this is just standard Python, if you haven't used iterators in Python before. Here's my training data loader that databunch.create creates for you. 
Um, and you can check that, as you would expect, the X is 64 by 784, because it's 784 pixels flattened out, 64 in a mini batch, and the Y is just 64 numbers. There are things we're trying to predict. So, um, and you know, if you look at the source code for databatch.create, you'll see there's not much there, right? So feel free to do so. We just make sure that like your training set gets shuffled, randomly shuffled for you. We make sure that um, the data is put on the GPU for you. Um, just a couple of little convenience things like that. Um, but don't let it be magic. If it feels magic, check out the source code to make sure you see what's going on. Okay. Um, so rather than do this y hat equals x hat a thing, we're going to create an nn.module, right? If you want to create an nn.module uh, that does something different to what's already out there, you have to subclass it, right? So subclassing is very, very, very normal in PyTorch. So if you're not comfortable with subclassing stuff in Python, go read a couple of tutorials to make sure you are. Uh, main thing is you have to override the constructor under init and um, make sure that you call the superclasses constructor because nn.module superclasses constructor is going to like set it all up to be a proper nn.module for you. So if you're trying to using if you're trying to create your own PyTorch subclass and things don't work, it's almost certainly because you forgot this line of code. Um, all right. So the only thing we want to add is we want to create an uh, an attribute in our class. Uh, which contains a linear layer, an nn.linear module. What is an nn.linear module? Um, it's something which does that, but actually it doesn't only do that, it actually is x at a plus b. So in other words, we don't have to add the column of ones. Okay, that's all it does. Okay, so you, if you want to play around, why don't you try and create your own nn.linear class? You could create something called mylinear. And it, it'll take you, you know, depending on your PyTorch background, an hour or two. Um, and then you'll feel like, okay, this is, we don't want any of this to be magic. And you know all of the things necessary to create this now. So, you know, these are the kind of things that you should be doing for your assignments this week is not so much new applications, but try to start writing more of these things from scratch and get them to work. Learn how to debug them, check what's going in and out and so forth. Okay. Um, but we can just use nn.linear, and that's just going to do, so it's going to have a def forward in it that goes a at x plus b, right? Um, and so then in our forward, how do we calculate the result of this? Well, remember, every nn.module looks like a function. So we pass our x mini batch, so I tend to use xb to mean a batch of x um, to self.lin, and that's going to give us back the result of the a at x plus b on this mini batch. So this is a logistic regression model. A logistic regression model is also known as a neural net with no hidden layers. So it's a one layer neural net, no nonlinearities. Um, because we're doing stuff ourselves a little bit, we have to um, put the uh, weight matrices, uh, the parameters, uh, onto the GPU manually. So just type dot CUDA to do that. Um, so here's our model. And as you can see, the nn.module machinery has automatically given us a representation of it. It's automatically stored the .lin thing, and it's telling us what's inside it. So there's a lot of little conveniences that PyTorch does for us. Um, so if you look at now at model.lin, you can see, not surprisingly, here it is. Um, perhaps the most interesting thing to point out is that our um, model um, automatically gets a bunch of um, methods and properties, and perhaps the most interesting one is the one called parameters, which contains all of the yellow squares from our picture, right? It contains our parameters. It contains our weight matrices and bias matrices in as much as they're different. So if we have a look at p.shape for p and model.parameters, there's something of 10 by 784, and there's something of 10. So what are they? Well, 10 by 784, okay, so that's the thing that's going to take in 784 dimensional input and spit out a 10 dimensional output, because that's handy, because our input is 784 dimensional, and we need something that's going to give us the probability of 10 numbers. After that happens, we've got 10 activations, which we then want to add the bias to. So there we go. Here's a vector of length 10, 
So you can see why this, um, this model we've created has exactly the stuff that we need to do our AX plus B. So let's grab a learning rate. We're going to come back to this loss function in a moment, but we can't use MS, well, mm, we can't really use MSE for this, right? Because we're not trying to say how close are you? Did you predict three and actually it was four? Gosh, you were really close. It's like, no, three is just as far away from four as zero is away from four when you're trying to predict what number did somebody draw. So we're not going to use MSE. We're going to use cross entropy loss, which we'll look at in a moment. And here's our update function. I copied it from lesson two SGD. Um, but now we're calling our model, rather than going A at X, we're calling our model as if it was a function to get Y hat. And we're calling our loss func, rather than calling MSE, to get our loss. And then this is all the same as before, except rather than going through each parameter and going parameter dot sub underscore learning rate times gradient, we loop through the parameters. Okay? Because very nicely for us, um, PyTorch will automatically create this list of the parameters of anything that we created in our Dunder init. And look, I've added something else. I've got this thing called W2. I go through HP and model.parameters and I add to W2 the sum of squares. So W2 now contains my sum of squares weights. And then I multiply it by some number which I set to 1A neg 5. So now I just implemented weight decay. Okay. So when people talk about weight decay, it's not an amazing magic complex thing containing thousands of lines of CUDA, C++ code. It's those two lines of Python. That's weight decay. This is not a simplified version that's just enough for now. This is weight decay. That's it. Okay. And so here's the thing. Um, there's a really interesting kind of dual way of thinking about weight decay. One is that we're adding the sum of squared weights. And that seems like a very sound thing to do, and it is. And um, well, let's go ahead and run this. Uh, so here I've just got a list comprehension that's going through my data loader. So the data loader gives you back one mini batch and for, for the whole um, thing, giving you x, y each time. I'm going to call update for each. Each one returns loss. Um, now, PyTorch tensors, uh, since I did it all on the GPU, that's sitting in the GPU, and it's like got all this stuff attached to it to calculate gradients. It's going to use up a lot of memory. So if you, if you, if you call dot item on a scalar tensor, it turns it into an actual normal Python number. So this is just means I'm returning back normal Python numbers. Um, and then I can plot them and yeah, there you go. My loss function is going down. And you know, it's really nice to try this stuff to see it behaves as we expect. Like we thought this is what would happen. As we get closer and closer to the answer, it bounces around more and more, right? Because we're kind of close to where we should be. It's kind of getting flat, probably flatter in weight space, so we're kind of jumping further. And so you can see why we would probably want to be reducing our learning rate as we go. Learning rate annealing. Okay, now, here's the thing. That is only interesting for training a neural net because it appears here. Because we take the gradient of it. That's the thing that actually updates the weights, right? So the, actually the only thing interesting about WD times sum of W squared is its gradient. So we don't do a lot of math here, but I think we can handle that. The gradient of this whole thing, if you remember back to your high school math, is equal to the gradient of each part taken separately and then add them together. So let's just take the gradient of that, right? Because we already know the gradient of this is just whatever we had before, right? So what's the gradient of WD times the sum of W squared, right? Let's remove the sum and pretend there's just one parameter. It doesn't change the generality of it. So the gradient of WD times W squared 